This is a discussion with Caleb Cooley. And we decided to have a talk on uh, the Books of Commons Beaumont and also my latest videos talk about a bit of what he's been up to and what his, where his en- interests lie when it comes to Commons Beaumont. Uh, how are you doing, Caleb? <laughs> I am doing good. I just made another <laughs> cup of coffee and Excellent. I've been sitting here researching and putting some stuff together for my website and it's pretty exciting that's uh, the van helsing library yes yes van helsing library.com excellent a lot of weird things have been happening uh over the past year or so and one of those weird things was your video popping up on my phone notifications when it did when i (laughs) when i looked down um it was actually on uh freaking uh 12 21 21 i remember because some other stuff was popping up in my my feed on that day so it was like 12 21 21 Uh, (laughs) yeah uh december 21st 2021 and i saw your your video uh the fall of loki <laughs> i'm the like fall of loki yeah yeah what what did you think of uh the fall of loki and uh what made you uh want to have this discussion after watching it well since we're reading commons beaumont uh I don't know of anywhere, anybody else who um, positions these myths on the western coast of Scotland and uh, up in the Shetlands like he does. I've never seen anybody else suggest it. And the Pillars of Hercules, Fingal's Cave, and there uh, I think there's a few other ones. Uh, these are all basalt stone formations yes that's off right. the western coast of scotland they are these pillars of geometrically shaped basalt stones they're sitting right in the water and yeah. they have caves on the inside and at high tide you can take a boat into the cave and when you're inside of the cave you see um it's like being in a temple because all of these you're surrounded by all of these straight pillars up and down pillars yeah that's that like geometrically the, uh, shaped that's yes. the isle of staffa uh fingal's cave yes that's right yeah you're, to- you're talking about that right yes yeah and these are the uh, fingal's cave uh is this a separate site from the pillars of hercules or is this the same it's site? A s- separate site Uh, yeah it's a northeast island uh, but they're they're the same type of formation with these basaltic pillars yes yes and uh where you know which really really caught my attention and kind of like um threw me into a spin when i was uh reading the mysterious comet by beaumont he starts talking about how uh these Comula pillars of the Isle of Staffa and and uh, Fingal's Cave, Giant's Causeway, that they were drilled by magnetic currents and that they were the former cause of planets. And I kind of just it really blew my mind. Uh, it really started my... Um, it, because, <clears throat> you know, uh, I, I, I started reading The Mysterious Comet and... Uh, the riddle of the earth and i wanted to see if he was like flagging anywhere because i was reading this stuff that I, i'd never heard of anything like it before i'd never heard of meteorites 
hitting volcanoes or striking volcanoes. I never heard of this idea that they could be attracted to them by some kind of influence that really hadn't been measured or looked into or was being ignored before. And it, it, I was, you know, I, I, I got to admit, I, I, I was taken aback and I thought uh, Commons might be crazy. <laughs> I thought, oh, OK, so he's a science cook and he's a historian, he's, he's an incredibly comprehensive historian. You know, I was I wasn't <laughs> I wasn't sold on the idea at all, but it was this niggling question in the back of my head, like, what if there's proof of this? What if I can see if I can find, you know, so <laughs> something that backs this stuff up. And uh, yeah, go, going back to Fingal's Cave and uh, Giant's Causeway, uh, what is it? The Garvelock Isles he talks about as well, and various other places like that waterfall in Isle of Skye. The learning about those magnetic currents and how they could only be formed, those geometrical shapes could only be formed under under such massive magnetic I want to talk about stress, those magnetic know. currents uh, real quick. Yeah, yeah sure, um, sure. And the Superman movie, uh, you see Superman goes into the ice cave and yeah. it has the same sort of uh, pillar formation as you see in yeah. Tinkle's cave. A Common Beaumont amorphous, explains like. in his, yeah, Common Beaumont backs up what he's saying as far as that goes by the fact that when you go to the North Pole, you actually do see those same formations in the ice. And he says, because everybody's seen on the Discovery Channel where it shows the uh, the Earth and the Earth has this magnetic field around yeah. it that that Magnus, wraps. Yeah. Yes, it wraps in and it goes in at the poles. Yeah. And you've everybody's also seen the uh, animations where when the sun uh, blasts the solar winds. Exactly. Uh, what happens when the solar wind reaches Earth is that it hits the front of the Earth's magnetic uh, shield and it starts to wrap around, but it yeah. goes in at the poles. So it's all of this solar radiation that's curving in and actually making contact with the Earth at the poles. And I think that's what modern science attributes to the reason why our core is so hot. But yeah, of course, we're we can talk about this in a minute, but common Beaumont yeah. says says that the core is not hot, but he says yeah. what it does what <laughs> yeah. But he says that what does happen actually is that these solar the solar radiation does enter into the earth at the at the poles and when it does it literally slices through basaltic stone like a hot knife through butter and that's oh. what creates so the core of our earth will actually look similar to these rock formations we see yeah such as fingal's cave because commons beaumont says that the Fingal's Cave, the Pillars of Hercules, and those couple of other sites off of the western coast of Scotland. This is the core of another planet that was yeah. destroyed in the sky, and it landed off of what is now the western coast of Scotland. Incredible, right? And when you start to look all around the world for basaltic columns, have you seen these weird structures, you know, like Devil's Tower in, in America? Close Encounters of the Third Kind it was based on that, but I don't people don't think people really understand the significance of that <laughs> that edifice, you know, that natural edifice of the, the Devil's Tower, the Azores, uh, that massive strip in Iceland that I, that I show in my video. I, it's just incredible, right? <laughs> you think like this could have happened not just once, but a few times over. See, uh, most people's concept of the world and the history of the world is not taking these possibilities into consideration. Uh, the solar system, as it is today, Aristotle, he was sort of uh, obsessed with the idea that everything is in perfect harmony and regularity. 
the heavenly spheres. Who is that? Sorry, Aristotle. Oh, Aristotle. Yeah, he he talks kind about of. the the planets and how they're all uh, set in motion on this divine course that's never changing. Mercury, Venus, the Earth, the Moon, Mars, yeah. Jupiter, Saturn, they all have this perfectly predictable orbit yeah. that never oh you can look at an ephemeris and tell exactly where any of these planets are gonna be at any given time in the future or the past. However, the solar system has not been this way. Uh no. No, it's yeah, I'm going to realize like, you know, uh, so when they're talking about Venus back then, are they talking about the Venus now? Or are they talking about a comet or, or like a dislodged planet that came out of another planet? Like, <laughs> you know, and, and what, how are these planets coming out of other planets? <laughs> like when you actually start to really do some de deep research on the, on, on the vast history of this solar system you begin to realize like wow we really <laughs> we need to return back to the ancient texts and try and use them to decipher them to decipher actually what happened back then well your video uh your video series is a beautiful video series i, I watched it i watched those videos as soon as they were released and well the first one i did uh i've watched them all now but uh Damn, man, it, it, it's good because uh, you did some really good work with the graphics and uh, it really um, explains the concept of where Commons Beaumont is uh, yeah. asserting. And um, there's there's new people doing work uh, since then. You know, Emmanuel Velikovsky had a whole set of books where he posited different theories about where the planets used to be and uh, what what might have happened and the reasons why the planets are where they are now. And you have uh, David Talbot, Thunderbolts of the Gods Project, and he's doing, uh, he's got all these documentaries and uh, appendices to the documentaries explaining how yeah. symbols, like prehistoric symbols carved in rocks, uh, these were manifestations of what was seen in the sky while the solar system was actually changing position because yeah. the the ancients were down on the ground looking up and seeing the solar system rearrange itself so we have to go back a little bit because we talked about the magnetosphere but you know something that they don't like to talk about is that a magnet goes two ways right there's there's you can use use a magnet to repel but you can also use it to attract and they don't talk about much about how the magnetosphere attracts celestial bodies from outer space and right. i think with the history of this planet reason why there were so many crazy bombardments in the past as well dragging down whole planets to two hours our magnetic field must have been quite a bit stronger back then than it is now and i think that you know once we come to grips with how the geomagnetic grid of this planet really works, we'll understand and be able to predict great disasters a lot better as well. Well, you, you mentioned earlier that uh, Commons Beaumont is one of the only people who attributes meteorological phenomenon, as in weather, to meteors. He says that storms and rain this is actually caused by the debris which is deposited into the earth's atmosphere by the meteors that are passing through it so say there's going to be a big rainstorm well a few days previously there may have been meteors that pass through the atmosphere and left a trail of dust that you don't see but this is actually changing the chemistry of the atmosphere temporarily while it's settling and uh, causing electromagnetic and energetic changes. And then yeah. you have your storm. Yeah. Well, when I read that, I immediately combined that with uh, what Wilhelm Reich talked about, orgone energy. And okay. he studied the weather. He, he did, built did he? A, he did. And he built a machine called a uh, cloud buster. It looks like a like a cannon, sort of like yeah. a 
like a howitzer cannon kind of, but okay. it's, but it's like <laughs> a, a number of metal pipes perfectly mm. straight that are fastened together so that they're perfectly parallel. So wow. okay, uh, I, I think one of them had like <laughs> 50, yeah, 15 hollow metal pipes that are, um, sort of parallel. Uh, okay. <clears throat> And he's got it mounted up to a, a swivel that can point it at, in different directions, just like a you can control where a cannon is pointing. But yeah. at the ends, at the bottom of these pipes, he has a metallic uh, hose that he runs down into a body of water. So what happens, somehow this, this arrangement literally sucks the orgone out of the sky. Wow. <laughs> yes. Uh, because these parallel metal pipes are creating some sort of, I don't know, vortex or something, but, uh, right. the metallic nice. hoses run down into this, uh, this pond or river. And, uh, this, ac- th- this shit actually works. It's been done so many times really? that, yeah. So, so what it does is it sucks the orgone out of the sky yeah to the point to the point where you can't even touch the pipes is, with is your it hand going energy it'll... like like life energy yes it yeah. is yeah yes and is this uh, like is there a magnet in this how it's that type device oh all it is is parallel metal yeah. tubes wow yeah that's all it is that's and so uh which has a metallic contact all the way to the body of water, which is why he uses metallic hoses. So, so they're like flexible so he can run it down and it's sort of grounded in the pond or it's grounded in the river or whatever body of water he's, uh, has access to. So what it does is it, it will make it rain. He'll take, oh. he'll go somewhere where there's been a drought. He'll set as a set up his contraption connect the metal hoses and uh, submerge the end of the metal hoses into the pond or river, aim, and just wait. The orgone gets sucked out of the sky, and all of a sudden, after a certain amount of time, thunderstorm. Now, it's that easy. It's that easy to mess with the weather. E- and yeah, people are concerned easy. about chemtrails. Yeah. Right now, there's like, people, wow. there's, there's conspiracy people who... Uh, use these things to bust chemtrails. I don't know if they're smart to be doing that, but you're, you're not supposed to use these things, uh, without wisdom because it's very powerful energy. And if you, if you just put two and two together and, uh, take into account what Wilhelm Reich was talking about, then take into account what Commons Beaumont was talking about. What you're actually looking at is that, setting up this device is actually attracting meteors into the atmosphere. Oh, uh, right. yes. Yeah. If you, if you take commons Beaumont's knowledge into account, that's what, that's what you're dealing with. He's saying that's where weather comes from. That's why they call it meteorology. Yeah, I I know, right? I don't understand. I'm I'm t- trying to tell people like, look, the study of meteorology is not just the study of the weather. It's in the name. Can't you see, <laughs> can't you see that there's something in the name that like kind of would I don't know. You should pay attention to and really find out the meaning of. Oh, that's what Commons Beaumont, Beaumont was yeah. trying to tell him back then. And he, was, he was back he in the 1920s. It, he changed it to a uh, meteorism, right? Oh. What have they done now? They've popularized that term or like created a, a, a set of beliefs around that term that it's, it gives it a medical, it diverts people's attention away. And it's something to do with, uh, you know, having bad wind or something like that. <laughs> that's that's what meteorism is. When you search in Google, yeah, Commons Beaumont meant it, meant it in a completely different way. And uh, yeah. but yes. Well, uh, as a as an addition to that device, as far as the orgone energy goes. Yeah. Uh, Reich also did some work where he demonstrated as far as just the people's state of being, as far as their the the state of life force energy of the people on ground level actually affects the weather as well. Right, of course. Yeah. Yes, because we all carry around a, a particular electromagnetic frequency with us. 
and depending on what frequency we are harmonizing with or what what we're putting out i think on a grand you know is how many of us and i've i've heard other scientists talk about how we are basic how how we are basically like antennas for electromagnetic frequencies and you know if we are also putting out a signal depending on well, if you ever noticed uh, if you're listening to a radio yeah. and it's and it's really staticky every time you walk over to the radio it stops being staticky it actually starts clearing up because it's antenna you know it's made out of iron but yes iron is what your blood is made out of That's so true. so so you just became the antenna for that radio you know what else i found particularly interesting about Commons Beaumont and just around the time that I was starting to learn that and it, it became the subject part, part of the subject of uh, Dark Side of the Dragon uh, the video I did before the fall of Loki and that was this idea that uh, depending on what the meteors are bringing in with them it can affect the levels of toxicity in the air and make people sick and that that blew my mind again because Around about the time that the coronavirus lockdown was announced, Comet Neowise was in was in the skies. You could see it up in the sky, f- and, and it was it was clear for 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 anyone with a direct view. They they were able to see this massive comet streaming. Uh, it had like a, like a light lighter shade streaming out the back of its tail, and a and a blue shade. And I remember what comments Beaumont was said about about the blue. You know this massive cyanogen. He he said when there's a comet in the sky, epidemics break out because they bring with them toxic gases. All of this uh, stuff I was uh, synchronizing with. There was these signs, you know, and just telling me that I had to look deeper into this. And, and, and look at this as a possibility. But they you know. can bring gifts as well. Uh, a few years ago, I was up in Maine, and uh, it was getting close to sunset, and uh, I was at work. I looked out in the window, and I just saw that the entire parking lot and the entire landscape was glowing this, like, purple pinkish kind of like just glow it was like this glow in the air and i couldn't make sense of it i i uh went out i went outside took a break i'm just walking around out there and the whole sky the ever the whole landscape everything Mm -hmm. and this has happened a few times that i can remember but it was just like glowing this this color and uh the next day i called my friend who was all the way down in uh new hampshire like a hundred miles away i'm like did you see the colors last night before before the sun went down he's like yeah i did see that that was uh that was cool and um you could maybe attribute that to what uh a meteor or something brought into our field and yeah you know it could it could uh I would venture to say it has to do with people's states of mind oh. and their state of being. What are you going to attract into the earth? Yeah, you know, that's cr- um, that's interesting because I know, yeah, I know what you mean about these crazy sunsets. I've seen quite a few of them recently, actually, and uh, the the beauty of some of them that you could relate them to the height of a dragon that it's been like stretched out across the sky, like something I would. Uh, a, a, William Blake uh, with with his uh, red dragon paint, paintings, or you could look at it like a, a flayed out golden fleece, you know, like just this absolute. And I've stopped people in the street and I've been like, "Have you seen this?" And they're like, "Yeah, no, it's incredible." Like, I just, you know, don't know what's going up in the sky, but the, something just amazing. I'm I'm glad to hear that that's happening because um, last few days. <laughs> weather has been absolutely horrible <laughs> i don't know what's going on over here but the weather has been brutal really stormy weather cold just just uh just cold and like the cold that just like really it's not even that cold temperature wise and for me uh i know you guys use celsius over there uh 32 degrees is freezing to me yeah. i like it to be like I I would prefer it to be below zero rather oh, okay. than rather than just like hovering right there at freezing. 
because <laughs> because when it hovers at freezing, it's like I'm shivering to death, and it's like it's like. But when it's below zero, it just it just hurts, and that's it. It's like yeah, it's oh. it's gonna like hurt your face, but no big deal. It's not gonna like penetrate down to your bones. I don't know why. Yeah, <laughs> I have a friend from Kazakhstan, and uh, he he he's, he deals with like uh, minus forty degree degrees Celsius, uh, uh, and there's some Fahrenheit. But he he's yeah. dealt with that with those. But he comes over to to England, and he's uh-huh. like, bro, you you have no idea that the winds here are brutal. They cut you right to the bone. And I'm like, <laughs> like uh, you know, every time he says it, it just reminds me more about what. Uh, <laughs> comments Bowman was saying you know about how, how much bad weather the uh, the UK gets but yeah uh, yeah where where do, where, where do we go from here oh well, yes um, yes okay you um, know what man I okay. am just I am just now starting to get into North Norse mythology because I have not really um, been interested until recently uh, but I just read the I just read the Eddas oh, okay. and um so talk about loki you know uh how did you connect how did you connect loki to this because uh the so far reading comments but i haven't got to where he's talking about loki yet well like i said like i say in my videos um a a few quotes from the british edda uh by la weddell saying Loki is Baldur's title as Lucifer. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I know it's in a completely different context. And the British Edda is actually about how uh, uh, the, no- the Nordic kings were mythologized into, in- into these stories and how they were you know, made into gods. But I even still, just that one line, how, how even Loki is even related to Lucifer I wanted to go down that line and, uh, and and then of course but but also finding out that loki was an earthquake god that blew my mind and the inferences that Commons beaumont makes in the riddle of prehistoric britain is he, he kind of just puts in it just f- uh, throws in a few footnotes about loki really i want to ask because uh i actually I actually don't remember what the Eddas say about how Loki died. I think it was Odin and Loki were the cause of each other's death in the Ragnarok. How did you how, how did you make the connection that it was an Irish hero, Finn McCool, that was responsible for Loki's downfall? Again, in the riddle of prehistoric Britain, he he, he brings it up in passing almost and, and he footnotes bits of information about Loki down the bottom, but he likens Loda to Loki. Um, I, I, I stated it in my video, but it's, it's actually comes Beaumont who said it. And also that, that con- connection between Fingal and s- say, um, when Loki gets imprisoned, he, he becomes so enraged that he causes earthquakes. Well, once, um, what, what once uh, Loda is struck down, it's almost like he becomes uh, <laughs> the evil Obi Wan Kenobi. You know, once he's struck down, he becomes even more powerful, and he becomes this massive column of towering smoke. And just like some of the scenes, some of the HD scenes that we've seen this year of the vol- volcano La Palma, uh, when when it erupted this year. It had a black tornado with a fire spout coming out the top of it. And it was like, I, I was actually torn whether I should actually use that footage for the description of Loda. And when, you know, when he, uh, when he's talking and when I, when I do the voice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, I have uh, not seen that, but it sounds wicked. Uh, the, the, the La Palma uh, black tornado. I, I, all this, all this, uh, meteors and volcanoes and comets you've, you've uh, been saying, this has gone completely under my radar. So <laughs> I'm, it, I'm listening. Like I said, I had these doubts about what Commons Beaumont was saying about, uh, the earth and, and these attractions being the, the, the earth magnetically attracting celestial bodies from the outside. And, 
well, when I actually started to research it and find out how this relates to climate change, how, how this, you know, how uh, depending on how many meteors we get a year, that is going to directly affect, uh, the, you know, how the, the, the temperature of the planet, the climate of the planet. Uh, and uh, yeah, don't worry about it, man, because apparently the whole of the Western world, it's been going under, under the radar, except from, of course, Michael Cesarian and uh, David Whitehead and people like you. Uh, and and apparently a few Mexican guys like this um, uh, Jamie Mousen, he's called. He has a um, it's this Mexican documentary maker. Uh, he he does uh, UFO sighting volcano volcano videos, but he he makes the connection. He makes the connection with magnetism and mm. um, and the volcano, and he talks about how. Um, well, there's there's also I know I know for one thing there are yeah. Uh, there are occultists who go to all of these volcano sites and uh, places like this as far as geology. Uh, they don't just go to like ancient temples and things. They're going to geological fissures and things where this stuff happens and they're doing or yeah. the, where these things happened in the past and they're doing rituals there. No, oh, that's right. Uh Jamie Mousen on his YouTube he, in, a, in a documentary, he talks about the famous Mexican paint, painter. He's called Jose Geraldo Murillo, uh, otherwise known as Dr. Atoll. And he was so fascinated with volcanoes, with uh, Popocatapetl in particular, one of Mex Mexico's most volcanic and uh, mo most active volcanoes. He actually went inside of the cone and he saw weird phenomena inside of that volcano he saw meteors coming in and out he saw weird magnetic emanations fiery emanations like like um aurora like the aurora lights but with flames of fire and things like that rising out in, in into different shapes of the volcano um so they actually and that's leg that's legit yeah. too uh yeah yes it is it, it's been called the odic force actually where oh, when you're okay. in, in the dark it uh, actually appears as a misty flame. I just uh, put up a new blog post last night that talks a little bit about that. Uh, this is what uh, yeah. uh, he, uh, this person has the ability to, to see uh, manifestations to some degree. Is that what oh, he's saying? Oh no. oh no, he's not saying that. He's saying that this, these things happened. Uh, Jose uh, Geraldo Murillo, he, he was certain that uh, not only were UFOs uh, flying in and out of volcanoes, but also there was meteoric activity going on. And, oh, I'm, no kidding. Uh, and I've got to confirm that I've been researching uh, live cam footage and, you know, that what I was, what I managed to put in my, in my newest videos is only the tip of the iceberg. I, I've been able to collect meteoric footage, uh, uh, you know, me meteoric uh, meteor strikes. Uh, but what, one thing I keep coming up against as well are things that I just can't explain. Okay, the meteor strikes are, are amazing enough, but then I, I come upon what, what might be a promising meteoric strike video, and then, no, actually, th it's going the opposite way to what it would be if it was a meteor strike. And there's things flying out of uh, volcanoes, and there's things coming, like, parking around, like, almost like a jet Jetsons car or something like that flying around, swerving around it, and just parking up next to the volcano as if it was coming in for a pit stop. Uh, okay. There are so many unexplained things that go on around volcanoes. Commons Beaumont explains some of the things like this. There were, uh, around uh, Popocotta Petal, the past, uh, during the last three years, there's been two occasions where there, there have been these weird firefly, like magnetic emanations, like these firefly lights like these magnetic lights all around the volcano like fairies flying south for the summer or something like that it, 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 it's so bizarre um again like i get that from the mousen documentary what Another, is the most yeah. uh what is the most recent uh events that you've seen along these lines most most recent yeah uh well <clears throat> I'm always uh, interested in when they find out about 
a, a, like I say, an eruption like the recent Hunga Tonga Hunga eruption. It's this massive eruption that happened on this island near New Zealand. Oh, my, my, geog my, my geography is terrible unless I have a map in front of me. <laughs> but um, this, there was this huge explosion and it could see, you could see it from space. And, and uh, the geologists that were on the case were, they were completely taken aback by it. They had no way of predicting this and the way that they explained this away was that they didn't have the equipment, but yet they, you know, all the volcanology uh, institutes are uh, tied in with the space agencies and I'm sure you know if they really wanted to they could have you know monitored this thing from afar didn't have to have you know, with all the more expensive equipment in the world I think that you know they could have uh, they probably do they probably know when these things are on their way with in in advance but that's just a suspicion of mine you know it's just speculation uh, but it is curious that one of the the main volcanology institutes how, how do i say it like it, it's a it's a group that outsources to the space agencies it connects them it's it, it's it's called comet like it's an anagram it's like c o m e t but it's actually called comet and i just just like the name meteorology i find that very suspicious and there's a, there's another example I'm, i i can't think of right now but yeah, like I got to think. Um, getting back to Hunger, Tonga, Hunger. Have you seen anything about that? Did you see that explosion? No, none no. of this stuff has been popping up on my radar because just uh, in the last few weeks, it exploded, and they could uh, they could see this from the satellites. Like the, the explosion was so huge, it was uh, the biggest eruption that that volcanoes had, and in, in, I think it's the the most explosive. Um, so that was really interesting and they, how they didn't have any way to predict that even with what is your feeling about all this as far as uh could this be a good thing or a bad thing or overall what do you think what's so, your instinct to you meteorism and the idea that we're these being recent, bombarded these recent things yeah all these recent things <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean if astrology has anything to say for it, I think Fiona Edgar this week said that there's something was bad was going to happen. Uh, I don't know. We, she doesn't know what that's going to be. She didn't specify at all. But uh, there's already been already been some crazy things going on. Mount Semeru in Indonesia blew its top last year, and it was incredible, and and it, and it caused a lot of death and destruction, way more than you than you'd hear about the La Palma volcano going off. You know these things; they couldn't predict them. Every time I, I go on this guy's um, YouTube, he's called uh, Geology Hub. I'm pretty pretty sure he's a geologist, but he, he every, every time with the La Palma one, uh, the, Mount Semeru, and Hunga Tonga, they couldn't predict them. Why? Because they didn't have enough money and funding and, and equipment, apparently. You know, the best volcanologists in the world, you know, monitoring not that many volcanoes on the planet that, I, that I, I actually thought. Like, what is it, like 750 or something like that volcano, volcanoes in the world? It's not really that many for, for the, the, you know, the world's collective power. You, you'd think that they'd, they'd have a handle on this situation, be monitoring uh, these, these sites, but... No, every answer we get is, oh, we don't really know how eruptions happen. And, you know, we don't, <laughs> we haven't sent a camera down to the core. We don't, we don't really know what's going on down there, but we've made an educated guess. Well, maybe sounds like they're using the money guesses. for something else. Yeah. I mean, you know, one thing was hard to swallow is that the Japanese and the, Ma and the Mexicans know way more about this than we do. They have been studying their volcanoes. On, on the final part of Follow Loki, I put a few studies underneath just to show, show people that there are strange geomagnetic things going, like they call them geomagnetic anomalies. But just that, that even that is enough to go, wait, wait a second, what, what about what's going on with these volcanoes and what could be, they, what function do they serve with this mechanism that's happening around these sites? Uh, it, it's a, a topic. Of endless fascination but again it was hard really hard to swallow that the japanese they know about it they, they they're videotaping these volcanoes and getting these really like high definition cameras to be able to capture these bull-eyed flashes 
quite a few of them are put in at the end of the, the final part of Fall of Loki. And uh, I got I got to uh, give those guys an applause just for, you know, putting them up <laughs> up online. And because uh, it's just some of the most incredible footage I've ever seen. I've not, you know, how many times do you do, do you see a bowl light like that, like travel so, so close to anywhere and we don't have any anything like that in england really if we see a, a bolide uh go off if it if, you know if there's a, a green explosion in in the sky it's very rare and people still you know say still have this kind of like superstition that they um they, they might be bad omens you know uh, it's that rare but to some of these japanese channels and mexican channels where they've just been recording the live footage and you know you have to search in Japanese, and you have to search in Mexican like Meteoro Bolido, <laughs> but they come up, and if they don't come on, up under that, they come up under uh, volcano UFO. Okay, if if first you don't find anything to do with meteors and volcanoes, search UFO and volcano, and uh, change the languages to Mexican and Japanese and see what comes up because it will it will blow your mind you know interesting thing about uh the volcano cults um and one of Emanuel Velikovsky uh Emanuel Velikovsky's books called Mankind in Amnesia he talks about how at a certain point in time the sky was blacked out from all of the soot and it lasted for years yeah and certain tribes actually had to live near active volcanoes in order to stay warm because it was freezing out of course so yeah yeah imagine yeah. spending spending years in exposed weather trying to find a balance between freezing cold air on one side and magma hot lava on the other just trying to survive yeah i i know one of the things i've been doing for my for the next video that's going to come out the fire of prometheus because i i find it fascinating and uh, you know this incredible you know when he when he talks about how volcanoes represented the savior of mankind that uh, Mount Prometheus, when it went off in ancient times, it warned Deucalion that there was an even greater disaster on its way. And that these, you know, seeing the fire of Prometheus, seeing the eruption of Mount Prometheus, warned Deucalion that the deluge was on its way. And we, that is another point. It, it tells me that people who are experts in these fields, maybe they do, maybe they don't. Maybe they ignore it, but th there's something else going on with these volcanoes. And if any, if these minor eruptions in, in comparison, like the the La Palma volcano that went off, and Hunga Tonga Hunga, and Mount Semeru, if these are just like kind of minor things, warnings that something else, gr something greater is on its way. We are in for a wild ride, and and we should really start to look to these guys like Commons Beaumont to start figure out how this planet actually really works and rediscover what the ancients, as Commons Beaumont says, the ancients knew knew the science of it and didn't really separate the science from the the mystery or or the um, the spiritual nature of these uh, structures, these geomagnetic structures, fissures. Right. There were ceremonies and rituals that actually connected with the earth energy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was thinking about all these um, guys who like to talk about the Moloch um, sacrifices um, inside the, the belly of the bull. But I see that it also as like, you know, delivering onto the onto the volcano kind of thing as well. Like. That was that, that, that of one. course was post catastrophe. Post catastrophe, yes, yes. Yeah. Are you are you are you talking about further back? Uh, there, yes, because uh, there were uh, ceremonies before the catastrophes, mm. and they connected with the earth energy. You know, it uh, it was how the solar system was held 
together in its previous formation. And it, it, it is attributed by some that the cause of the catastrophe was um, due to corruption as right. far as ceremonial magic. And yeah. after the catastrophe happened, then everybody uh, transferred over to corrupted religion and ceremonial magic. So uh, that's what we're still digging our way out of, basically, the sump. Yeah, for some reason, I had that film pop into my mind, uh, the Tom Hanks film, when he almost gets sacrificed to the volcano. In fact, he does, but the volcano ends up spitting him out again. I don't know if that's like further symbolism on on, on, on the theme. Uh, and, you know, not even a volcano wants to eat Tom Hanks. I think that uh, that says something. But have you seen that movie? <laughs> where, he's, where he's talking to a soccer ball? Uh, no, no, that's uh, <laughs> that's Outcast or something like that, right? Uh, uh. But, I don't think that, I've seen that one. No, you haven't seen. Yeah, I can't remember what it's called now. But there's a movie. Uh, Tom Hanks thinks he's dying, and he may, makes up his mind that he's going to jump into a volcano. Uh, and you know, there's this um, tribe, also that you know want to make a ceremony out of it. And he ends up getting thrown in the volcano, but it's just as there's an updraft, and they end up um, getting spat out of it again, intact. But just even in, in like in uh, shows in, in films like that where it's a comedy and you're not supposed to take it seriously, there's some there's some deep deeper uh, meaning to that, right? Yeah, you know I'm I'm collecting uh, all of the old '80s fantasy adventure films like uh, Land Before Time. Oh wait, no. no, no, no. Never mind, not that one. <laughs> I don't know why that popped in my head. <laughs> never mind. Uh, <laughs> I think I, I think I meant to say never ending story. <laughs> and uh, you know, Conan the Barbarian, uh Kroll, the Beastmaster, all of yeah. these. Um and once I get all those, there's some really cool ones that are even older, like from the 50s like some of the hercules uh i've got them bookmarked uh one that pops out is one of the old hercules movies and i i have the trailer for it i've not seen it but it shows like two cliffs and there's a rainbow going over between both cliffs and then hercules walks across it uh Let's talk about the Rainbow Bridge because this could really get interesting. Okay. You yeah. talked about the Rainbow Bridge and the fall of Loki. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned the never ending story there, you know, like the, the, the whole of like the way that the nothing, the hurricane of this, this black, uh, you know, hurricane of blackness of nothing is just, just destroying everything. It reminds me of uh, the myth of uh, Loda and Fingal again. Um, but what, what did you want to uh, go? Oh, yeah, the Rainbow Bridge, right? Um, what's it called again? <laughs> Forget the name now. Oh, Bifrost. Yeah, so the, the fall of Atlantis, right? What was the Shetlands before the Great Catastrophe? What happened there? And, you know, what, how much land was lost? How was the world changed forever? And, and not only that, how much do these myths tie in? Like, Bifrost, the Rainbow Bridge in the Nordic mythos. How? What does that relate to our, our ancient history? And could Bifrost have represented these lost lands of Atlantis, which supposedly to Beaumont, the British Isles were a mere were a mere remnant, right? Uh, something that that's popped into my head recently about the Rainbow Bridge is that what what happens when you combine all of the colors of the rainbow as light spectrum it turns into golden white light you know if you mix mix all the colors of paint together it turns black but if you mix all of the colors of light together it turns golden white light remember in the lord of the rings they didn't show this in the movie yeah but when gandalf and saruman are talking together and Saruman reveals that he's betrayed everything good 
he says, I am no longer Saruman White. I am mm. Saruman of many colors. Right. And his yeah. cloak, his cloak uh, divides the spectrum of light into many different colors, and he tries to hypnotize Gandalf with it. Really? Mm. Yeah, and the, uh, I think Gandalf's response was... I don't remember his exact wording, but you're not supposed to do that. So if, uh, if the analogy is true, then you look at the North and you have all of these different places. You have Iceland, you have Norway, Sweden, mm-hmm. Finland, you have Ireland, you have Scotland, Wales, Britain. Yeah. Denmark, all of these places with all of these unique personalities. Not to say that it was all, uh, not to say there was no uniqueness before, but it's like we know that these lands were connected in the past, and it's the result of cataclysm that has divided these lands. That's right. It's Dog like the lands, analogy. Right? It's like the analogy of splitting the light into uh, all the all of the different oh, right. colors. Right. Of course. Yeah, and I was just thinking about how hypnotizing the symbol of the rainbow is, and we know how hypnotizing it can be, and how effective it can be as well, because we see the rainbow everywhere now. You know, I don't think we need to comment upon, upon what agenda that is being attached to, but it's it's weird how he uses the the, the rainbow to uh, to hypnotize Gandalf, like he doesn't know where to go, he doesn't know which strand to to go from. Like Saruman, the body of Saruman has been uh, divided, right? Just like exactly, uh, yeah, just like the the ancient lands of Atlantis or Hyperborea. Um, I need to go take a little break. Uh, I'll be right be like 30 seconds. Is that okay? Sounds good. Can we take a five minute break? Yeah, of course. All right.